Mr. President, dear Klaus, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to give the keynote at this event in 2018. And I'm also keen to join later on the debate and the panel with my former colleague Heinz Watzka, um, who is an excellent moderator. And I'm quite sure that he will drag all the secrets and all the information which is not given in our presentations out of us for a lively discussion later. When I um, thought about talking about safety at this conference, um, I felt for the first time a little bit uncomfortable compared to previous years. Well, I have given many speeches about safety and described the German technology and innovation so far, and I didn't want to repeat myself. So I thought, well, what we do here in Germany has become common sense. We maybe sometimes do, do not even think about it. So I thought a good title might be a provoking title like safety, so what? But on the other hand, I think this would not be really correct because all the engineers and the operators, they really stress safety. They are aware of this every day, every hour. And maybe the slogan, safety first, describes this best. But safety first is usually addressed with um, workers' safety, safety at work, and not with pipeline safety. So I think it's not the appropriate description. However, um, if I think about how many companies deal with safety, they mainly focus on operation. And the German view is a quite different one, because we believe that safety starts with design and construction of pipeline and that the pipeline later on has an inherent safety in itself due to the chosen design. So the design phase is, is very important. And for this reason, standards are very important. And that's the reason why you can find also now in my speech some German standards and I'll explain how they function and what is the impact on the safety or the security of a pipeline. Then I had a third view on this topic. Uh, and during the last weeks, I have given many speeches about the Energiewende. This is a topic which is quite um, of importance at the moment in, in Germany. And my mission is always then to say, yes, we need the gas infrastructure. Yes, we need the gas pipelines. And no, we are not facing an all-electric world consisting only out of cables and wires. This is totally wrong. We cannot rely on only one grid the power grid, we need the gas grid. For security reasons, for cost reasons, for the speed of decarbonizations. And recently I heard also about the three Ds which characterize some energy policies which are decarbonization, decentralization, and latest one, digitalization. And all these three topics need pipelines to decarbonize our society by the use of natural gas instead of coal, to decentralize our energy supply by CHP units, units of smaller size, maybe in the households and not running anymore the big power plants in the future. And also digitalization, maybe that surprises some people, has a lot to do with this gas infrastructure because it's the element where we couple the power grid to the gas grid through power to gas technology, through sector coupling. So digitalization and optimization of the entire energy system, both power and gas will be of great importance in the future. Infrastructure is important, and maybe also for a second use and a second life, which has exactly to do with the energy vendor or energy turnaround. And therefore I choose this title, safety first for a second use, safety first for a second life. However, if you want to keep on your license to operate in a country and want to utilize the pipelines for further purposes, for example, to inject biogas, hydrogen, to use pipeline as power storages, there is no doubt that you need acceptance for your infrastructure. And acceptance can be only achieved through transparent communication and through publication of what you do in terms of safety. And this connects exactly to the final panel um, of this conference, where at the end of this conference, you will talk with other experts about public acceptance and the license 
to operate. I think this is an inherent part of any safety policy. So my three insights by thinking about just the title of my presentations were then at the end, operational pipeline safety is strongly determined through design and construction. Safety policies have to cover technical issues, that's clear, but also communication, which is a challenge for many engineers. And third, natural gas pipeline being safe and accepted, provide the door into our energy future and will face a second use. Let's have a closer glance to these ideas. I, just, I try to sketch here how many people think about the safety of a pipeline. Maybe we can measure it with a safety indicator. And in some codes and standards, you will find that over the time, a pipeline has to face its end of life. So let's say after 50 years, it's put out of operation. This is justified through phenomena like aging, degeneration, corrosion, etc. However, for me, this is a little bit in contradiction to the assumption that the pipeline should be able to be operated safely at the beginning as well as the, at the end. So how does the safety level really develop over the time when we have to anticipate that, lie, that pipelines are aging? I try to draw a different picture, and this is my um, view of pipeline safety. Yes, there is a baseline that has to be met laid down in standards, usually at the date of the birth of a pipeline. However, we observe from experience that many pipelines have been built in a safer way. Especially all the pipelines have larger wall thickness than the codes and standards require, or they have other steel grades, higher steel grades. Here in Germany, we have special tightness tests, the so-called stress test, which is a little bit more sophisticated than the normal tightness test with water. And we know that with this construction requirements, their initial value, the initial safety value of a pipeline is usually higher than what is um, required from international standards. Of course, this needs to be verified, for example, through a zero or baseline picking or through other diagnostics. And of course, yes, pipelines are under threat. I took here as an example corrosions but there do exist sets of countermeasures to keep a pipeline protected from corrosion or if it occurs to start repair measures. We also know that the picture is not really true um, and that there are some uh, situations where we have to face near misses. For example, if an excavator approaches a pipeline. However, we have anticipated this from the very beginning through pro precaution measures like regular patrolling of pipelines or the right of way, which is laid down in law, markers, which give an indication where a pipeline has been buried, and also one call systems of systems where uh, companies who uh, drive excavators and digging machineries are obliged to find information of hidden cables, infrastructure, and pipelines. Even in case of a damage of a pipeline, in case of a leak, assume without ignition, there are modern technologies to detect methane, which is also at the moment a, a very hot topic, methane emission, methane, de methane detection. So also this has been already foreseen in the standards. But as you see from this example and also from the case of uh, ignited gas fire from a pipeline, public involvement becomes more and more imp important if we talk about these events. And therefore, it's clear that any safety policy does not only have to cover design on the left and operation technique, but also what I call preparedness and communication in case something happens, and also communication in order to create acceptance for the extension of their operation of a pipeline. Here is a visualization of the different threats according to the European statistics from the IGIC, we know that pipelines are exposed to third-party interference, corrosion, maybe also construction and material defects, hot tapping, ground movement, and other threats. But we find in our German standards suitable countermeasures. 
for example, against third party interference, um, depth of cover is uh, an important measure or a protection uh, layer on top of the pipeline. For corrosion, we have cathodic protection as another codes as well, um, but also passive protection, etc. What is important to see is that these measures always have a counterpart also during operation. So safety measures have to cover again the phases of design, operation, and if both fail and if gas is released, it has to be anticipated what to do in case of a damage. From my talks to different pipeline operators, I recognize that they focus more and more on the third issue, namely communication. That's extremely important because we are facing a time where people become more and more technical critical and more concerns about the pipeline, the windmill, the solar panel, or whatever in the vicinity, because technique is always related with risk, as we know. And I see here new approaches, especially in Germany, where, for example, the operators try to communicate with the people around the pipeline instead of just indicating with a document we are going to build the pipeline, they invite them for dialogues, present the project, present also the European need to supply this area with natural gas, present also the effect on the climate, that this is a climate-friendly technology, and give answers to concerns of the people in the room. In order to complete my presentation and the importance of the um, codes, I have included also this boring table here with the standards that have to be applied. Um, and you can see without going into details that all the infrastructure elements like pipelines, compressor station, wells, the regulating station, etc., even underground storages are, of course, covered with appropriate European standards and added by German standards. Most important are 460 three and 466 here. And again, you have the division between standards which are important for the design phase and others which are important for the operational phase. However, this is not the whole story because the insurance of a high product quality can only be achieved if the processes which, um, which occur like welding, um, the installation of the cathodic protection system and the pressure testing, if they are also in line with given standards as listed here. And let me have a little closer look to the pressure testing in Germany. As I mentioned before, we fill um, the pipelines with water during this test phase, but raise the pressure up to a limit where a plastic deformation of the pipeline happens. That means it's not only a pipe, it's not only a tightness test, but defects that have occurred during construction, nobody is perfect, they will be identified through this and will be, um, will be uh, we call it, shoot out of the pipeline because they will cause a leak of water. Here is a um, picture series of how pipelines are built in Germany. It starts with the removal of the soil, then the logistics with material stocking, pipe placement, the welding, which is supervised, of course, and um, the welds have to be 100% tested, not only samples, but 100% of our wells are tested. Trenching, the pipeline lowering, the backfilling. Of course, hot topics are crossing and pressing under autobahns or railways. And then the above mentioned hydro testing before we issue a certificate, which is also only valid for one year. And after one year, the operator has to achieve the final certificate to keep in operation. And he has to prove, of course, that he has also focused on the environmental issue and minimized the impact by recultivating the affected area. But, and this described, uh, was mentioned in my third pillar, we can also find in our standards um, elements which fit into the category preparedness and communication. Every operator has to have a safety management system in place. And this includes also risk assessment procedures prior to operation. That means he has to anticipate at the beginning, at the birth of a pipeline, what might happen if all the design measures and operational measures fail and gas is released. He is also obliged to have a standby service, which is uh, described in detail in our um, DPGW standard 1200. And he has to report about any incident that happens annually. We 
collect all asset information, the entire inventory of all operators in Germany, and collect also all incident data and issue triennial, uh, issue every three year reports on the trends um, and the incident likelihood. And lucky us, our figures are quite good as these two graphics illustrate. The average incident probability in Germany is below 0 0.1 incidents per uh, 1,000 kilometer, which is less than half the latest figure from the European um, IGIC stat statistics. You can see that the safety could be improved through the development of the standards by more than 90% over the years. And if you have a look to the right side, where these incident probabilities are subdivided into the probabilities for a whole rupture or other events, you can easily see that the probability of a rupture is less than 10 to the minus 5. And if you multiply this with the average ignition probability, which is 5 percentage, you automatically get a figure, a risk, just by mul multiplication of these two numbers, which is lower than 10 to the minus 6. That means without doing any further risk assessment study, counting lethalities or um, taking other probabilities into account, like inhabitant probability being at a place and so on, it's very clear that we are from the very beginning far below the acceptable um, risk threshold and that the pipelines are therefore safe and can be oper operated at any place near a football stadium as well as in a rural area. However, the question is, what happens if we use our pipelines for future purposes? And here I picked the example of nitrogen, of hydrogen injection in the pipeline. I think Germany will face a, um, a period where the hydrogen concentration will increase. We see this already now here and there, where hydrogen from windmill power production is injected into the German grid. We have more than 30 power to gas plants in operation, and only some of them convert the hydrogen into methane because this takes uh, some efficient, uh, efficiency points um, and, and makes the entire process less efficient. Therefore, the question is, um, what happens if we increase this hydrogen content? And maybe we will operate some of the pipelines in the future with 100% hydrogen. Of course, we have to reassess this and we have to adapt also our standards. And we are doing this at the moment. For example, for the first power to gas plants that inject hydrogen into the natural gas grid, we designed or we developed the standard G265, which describes exactly what has to be done also in terms of safety to ensure that this can happen without any a raise of the risk. We also support um, activities that um, head in the same direction from SEN TC234. They started the same debate because it becomes a European-wide topic now. St they have started this debate by looking closer at compressor stations. We know that the weak points are here the turbines because turbines, um, due to the guarantee from manufacturers, are usually limited in terms of hydrogen concentration by two, three, or four percentage. However, some spareheads like Siemens, for example, they have now developed turbines which can run with 10 or even 100 percent hydrogen. And starting with this weak point and discussing where other bottlenecks of hydrogen um, concentration might occur in the grid, we develop further and further on our standards. Another example is uh, G491, which is now uh, focusing on hydrogen injection in natural gas grid. It's a little bit different from the first one um, on, on top of this page, which um, focus on the connection to the power to gas plant. The latest one, uh, G491, addresses the general problem of hydrogen injection in natural gas grid. As you can imagine, I could uh, add up this list by many other examples because along the value chain, we have to assess the effect on distribution grids. We have to assess the effects on the appliance at the end, the heaters, the boilers, the cars, etc., and even the process chromatograph. But we have done this and um, therefore adapt our standards regularly. So coming back to my introduction, 
Um, safety depends not only on the way you operate a pipeline, but it depends strongly on the design and the, con and the standards that you have chosen. Here in Germany, we have a very high safety margin compared to other European standards. And I saw during my operational experience that many operators really lived on this standard and were happy to have this safety margin uh, from the design phase. Then safety during operation is, of course, uh, of great importance because operation is just the largest uh, time interval um, of, the li of the pipe itself. Um, inspection and repair techniques uh, take care that this integrity is also valid after many, many decades of pipeline, of pipeline life. Here we operate pipelines which are nearly 100 years old and can be stated that the integrity is still given. And this plus a transparent discussion about safety, an interactive discussion with scientists, with young students, with those who are in our committees that we run to develop our standards, make it happen that we can think about a second use or a second life of pipelines, which is so important to enter this new phase of our energy turnaround. Well, I could expand my, my uh, speech now and talk about other elements which are important, like certification, for example. As you can see here in this last slide about the services that we as the German standardization body offer, we're not only focusing on setting the standards, but we also do research, we certify companies and components, we educate, we train people, we communicate, and that's all to contribute to a safer operation of our pipeline and the future use for our energy turnaround. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.